Shalom, welcome. We're on uh, Tazria. And for today, I want you to turn to chapter 13. And we're going to use that for our kickoff point. Um, to be very honest, when I was a Christian and I was reading my Bible through, this would be the section I would skim through because it didn't seem to make much application to me. I never got pregnant, so I didn't have to worry about that whole business. Didn't have uh, menstrual cramps or periods, so I didn't do anything with that. And once I was, uh, and once I was circumcised, I quit worrying about that. So the only thing that was left was was Zaretz and. I never saw anybody with it, so I just never bothered to really read about it, except other than to know that it doesn't exist right now because of the fact there's no temple. So that's where we're at at this point in time. So normally, this section would be read with uh, the next section we're going to do next week, which is Metzora. And Metzora is dealing with a, a person who has uh, Tsaretz. And so... Well, I want to just focus on the first three verses as we go through this. Now, Saria, the title, comes from the idea of to conceive or give seeds. And that's why the beginning of this section deals with the, the mother and the, and the pregnancies and those things. But I want to go to chapter 13, and I want to specifically look at the first three verses in that chapter, okay? I have been studying all week long, and so I, my head is full, and hopefully I can get out of my mouth everything that's going on in my head. But it begins by saying, Hashem spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, if a person will have on, their, on the skin of his flesh. Now, I want you to understand the, the word for skin is or, and that's obvious, but the the particular words that I want you to look at are coming up. It says of the flesh are seis, sapach, uh, bahir, and it will become saras. Now, where you see the word saras, now, if you have an art scroll, it's a lot easier for me to tell you, but I, if you have an art scroll, I want you to look at the second line on the right-hand side. And I want you to look for saras, which is a uh, tzadi, a resh, an ein, and a tav. Okay. Now, the word that they f did not include in our discussion of saras will become saras is the word in front of it, which is the word neged. La neged. Neged means infliction. So when we're talking about this, this is an affliction of an legion of a lesion that's what we're talking about the affliction of the skin saras negev saras so it's the affliction of the skin and he shall be brought to aaron the kohen or to one of his sons the kohanim and the kohen shall look at the affliction on the skin of his flesh if the hair of the affliction has changed to white and the affliction appearance is deeper than the skin of the flesh it is a Zaris affliction. Now, deeper than the skin is a very difficult concept because what it's actually saying is it does not go beyond the skin. It goes the total depth of the skin. That's all we're talking about. This disease is only skin deep. So please keep that in mind because otherwise we get into the idea of leprosy. Leprosy is what we what all the Bibles have called it for all, all along, especially if you get into the New Testament. But the idea is, is the fact that this is a disease that is only skin deep. Leprosy is a, is a mutilating disease, and it's caused by bacteria. There's no bacteria involved in this. This is totally a spiritual disease. There is no other way to put it. It is totally going to be spiritual. Now, the, the thing that has always bothered me, or I've always curious about, is why God spent so much time 
making chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 all deal with this disease because it doesn't exist right now. But we also, as we're going through it, hopefully we'll get the understanding that this disease is significant and it always has been and always will be significant. It's just that it doesn't mark us today, but yet we'll have uh, times, if not all the time, have the affliction because of the things that we say. Most often this disease is correlated with Lashon Hara, with the evil tongue or evil speech, whatever you wanna call it. That's the way it's normally thought of. But I, as we're looking at it, it can also speak to murder, can speak to idolatry, it can speak to uh, um, sexual immorality, all of those other disease, all those other ailments in society can also be reflected in this. But for the most part, when we see it, we're only going to be talking about its relationship to our speech or how the speech is. It also tells us that the speech is about arrogance. So the people who receive this disease are dealing with an arrogant spirit. That's what's going on. So if we look at, at this particular thing again, one of the things that you should notice is the fact that Hashem tells Moses. Moses then is responsible for relaying the information to the group. So this is something that is being passed on. Now remember, most sections of the of the Torah, there's what they call the oral stories, the stories that go along with it. There are no oral stories for this. Everything that is given is put right in here. It's all written down. All of the protocols that one uses when they determine that they have it, all the protocols of how, how you are to be treated, when are you, what you're supposed to do, when you're healed, where what's your responsibilities all of it is right here in these in the bible itself so there's not really an oral to go along with this there are several understandings that were given by rabbis later on but there's nothing truly oral about it it is all explicitly stated for us that's what we have to understand so as we begin this whole thing i want to give you some i guess i was call it uh, background. Originally, this is one of three things that are listed for us. The first thing that was listed was on page uh, or in chapter 12, and that's dealing with the idea of a woman giving birth. Now, I didn't know, and maybe you already did, but I'm going to add to your understanding. Why is there bleeding involved in this whole process? Why does a woman menstruate? what's actually going on, which leads us into Zaretz. So uh, let, me, let me take a couple minutes and talk. Where I'm coming from is, a, a, is the Talmud, and it's coming from a section called Uravim 100b. And what it talks about is, it, it's the idea that Hava, Eve, disobeyed God in eating of the fruit. And in doing so, God placed upon her some not so nice blessings. One of those blessings is in childbirth. So that's an important understanding. And in this whole idea, it's about the idea of, as I think it's Genesis 3, 6 talks about increasing her suffering. So vaginal bleeding, all of that monthly period process, all of that came by way of Eve and what she did. Had she not sinned, there would have been no problem, no bleeding at all. In fact, if you go back to the oral stories, the first two children, Cain and Abel, or Cain and Havel, neither one of them did she recognize a bleeding issue. The bleeding came when she was confronted by God. That's when it actually occurs. So she's basically talking about something that she has done because of eating of that forbidden fruit. Now, in the story, as it goes along, it goes to the fact that she now has what we call 
Well, if she gives birth to a child, let me give you this one. If she gives birth to a child, if it's a boy, for seven days, she is in quarantine. She's in isolation. Those are the seven days that for her healing of her body. But remember, when she gives birth, there's blood and tissue and all of that. All of that's about dying. The idea of death coming. The menstrual cycle is about death as you eliminate the old tissue to replace it with new. Remember, the old tissue could have provided you with another child, but it's been released. And so therefore, she's starting over again. Well, seven days are required for that. That's for her husband to stay away from her. That is a, a family design that's built into this system. Now, in the process of this, of this design of family, so seven days, she's to be left alone. And in fact, it's called a, a uh, period of loneliness in sense. In other words, she's setting herself aside, just as you do with Saritz. So as she set herself aside, we now go to the idea of 31 day, 33 days. The 33 days that we're talking about are the days that have been added on. So it's a total of seven or 40 days for the birth of a boy. But when we talk about the birth of a girl, we're talking about seven days plus 56 days or 14 days plus 56 days. That's the girl. So she is twice as long. Then the question has been asked, why? The answer is, is the fact when, when mother births a girl, she's losing herself. But at the same point in time, she's losing something else. You see, the baby has all the eggs already formed that she will have for the rest of her life. So in other words, she is birthing the girl and the girl herself can technically reproduce. They found this out through abortion. An aborted female fetus, the eggs can be taken from the child and from those eggs, a new life can actually be created. Can you imagine being the child whose mother died before you were born. That's the concept behind it. That's why she spends 80 days. She spends the first 40 for the one that she just gave birth to, the second 40 for the one that has the potential for birthing kids herself. That's what's going on at this particular point in time. So anyway, one more point. When, when it, her period of time is ended, she goes to sacrifice. When she's sacrificing, she's sacrificing a sin offering. Why? Well, the, the Jewish understanding is, is that during the time that she's pregnant and giving birth, and I've not experienced it, although I heard about it from my wife as I was in the labor room with her, she had quite a painful experience. And sometimes the words coming out of her mouth were naughty. So therefore, we're talking about the idea of labor pains causing language problems, which therefore she needed to be forgiven for the language. So that was what was going on. So anyway, back to the story. So that's the first one. The second one is the idea of circumcision. Circumcision had already been covered before, but again, it goes back to the, to the notion of bleeding. And again, at the point of time of the circumcision, the, the boy child will bleed and therefore we, we cover that, that idea uh, fitting with this whole narrative. Now the next one, there's really not bleeding occurring, but the infection is such that it creates for us the understanding of something that is impure. And so as we're looking at it, then we're looking at this impurity. Now, Leprosy has been around for about 4,000 years, but so has Zaris. Really, Zaris is actually a disease that started prior to the building of the tabernacle. According to the, to the oral stories, the uh, Pharaoh, jo the one who did not know Joseph, actually had Zaris. 
Now, nobody knew how to take care of it or to cure it or what it was. So Pharaoh, with the advice of his, his magicians or whatever, began to kill babies and take the blood from the babies and bathe in that blood in order to eliminate the, the, the infection on his skin which obviously did not work because it's a spiritual disease, not a bacterial disease. And so that was the beginning. Now it became most evident when the tabernacle and the two temples were in function. After the temples were destroyed, Tsaris disappeared. No longer is it seen at this particular point in time. Not to say that it won't be seen during the third temple period, that I have no clue of, but I understand that at the end of the second period, that's the period where it, it began to no longer be a, about Zaretz. So Zaretz, according to the Arizal, is about a haughty spirit. And that's where its roots come from. Now, as you're looking at the text, the idea is to talk about the impurity of your thoughts and of your speech. So Zaretz causes a person's skin to change. Now, it usually is only a patch. There's several understandings for this. One is that God had warned you previously. The first patch was actually on the wall of your home. The second patch was on your clothing. Not heeding either of those or understanding either of those, the third patch was found on your skin. Now, why? If we go back to the tabernacle or the temple, when one is outside the temple, one is sufficiently far away that the holiness is not necessary. As you enter the gates and into the courtyard, you find that God's presence becomes stronger. As you move to the holy place where the menorah and the altar of incense and the showbread are, it's even holier. And finally, you reach the holy of holies, and that is the closest one can come to God. Now, at that closest point, conversations can occur, usually with the high priest. But the conversation with us is through our skin and understanding what's going on. So the skin becomes the, the, the source that they're talking about. So white, which we normally think of as, this, as the idea of purity, is actually in this case showing us the opposite, showing impure speech. Not the fact that we are totally impure because it doesn't cover our body, it only covers an area. Oh, by the way, the other place that Saris is actually found was the, by the Greeks. It was called psoriasis. Psoriasis and Tsaris come from the same, fall, same root. They both are together. I just thought I remembered that and I decided I'd let you know about it. Now, once a person has the, the white patch on his skin, he is to find a Cohen. It's the Cohen's responsibility to identify and diagnose it. You don't go to a doctor for it. Again, it's not bacterial. It is totally spiritual. So the only one who truly can understand is going to be the Cohen. Now, originally, the Cohen was Aaron. Aaron was the first one to really see it. He saw it in the Pharaoh, and then he again saw it with his sister Miriam. So he understood what it was. Now, there are three basic kinds and four different colorings of these three different kinds. So there's multiplicity of ways that it can show up. But all of them are white. The brightest white is the most severe. The lightest white is an eggshell color. It's the, it's the least evasive of all of them. But those are the things that are going to actually be going on or taking place at this point in time. Now, when you first are diagnosed, when you first go to a Cohen, a Cohen will look at it and he will not tell you anything except you should isolate yourselves this week and reflect on your life. Now, this isolation is to give you time to take care of this disease, the sin that's causing this on your own. 
by being alone, the hope is that you reflect on everything that you've uh, done or said, and mostly what you've said. And so in the case of our story, then, this person isolates themselves for seven days. Now, the, there are three different ways he can see this disease. One is it's the, it's the actual white spot, but in it, there will be black hairs. Now, in the second week when he looks at it, the black hairs turn white. He knows he has SARS. If you go to the second way, it's because the SARS has actually grown. In other words, the patch has actually gotten bigger. The third possibility is, is the fact that it's clear or clean, and then it begins to ooze on the flesh. That's the third way that one's going to be able to identify whether they have SARS. And the only one who does that is the priest. Now, the priest also is responsible for trying to do it in a loving, kind manner. In other words, he's not going to scream and bark at you. The idea is, is he's going to let you know that you need to be separated from the people. Now, oftentimes, when there are special events going on, the Cohen would not make a diagnosis until after the event was over. Say you were going to have your daughter or your aunt or your sister, somebody's getting married. And a marriage takes seven days back in those days. So he would wait beyond those seven days before he would actually tell you, prescribe to you that you have SARS and you need to go into isolation outside the camp, whatever that meant. You understand you're going outside the camp, which means that in some cases you're leaving a town. In some cases you're just leaving, going away from your family, maybe even to the backyard. The idea is that you're separate segregating yourself away those are the three things that are going on now most people when they have this disease the understanding was that that the idea is that this this there's denial if you have the the skin scab you've been told to go to the cohen and you finally agree you've begun by denying the fact that you had it first off you're scared second off you're really not interested in being identified as being different. Now, if this thing grows larger, then you have this self-loathing. You hate yourself because there's something wrong with you. And if you go even further than that, then you have to be the, by the fact that you're going to even distance yourself from everybody and everything. And that's not intended either. You're not to become a hermit or a Buddhist monk. The idea is that you're supposed to rectify what's going on. You're supposed to look at yourself and you're supposed to be reflecting upon everything that's going on around you. Reflect on what you've been saying, how you've been talking. Find yourself, in some cases, if it's at all possible, before you've already been isolated, talking with your family, talking with your friends who know you well enough. That's what was supposed to be going on. So as they're moving through this whole process, the idea was that there was the, going on this idea of, of imperfection within your spirit. Since it's a spiritual disease, there had to be a spiritual requirement. Isolation, followed by the mikvah, once you've been returned, followed by the burning of an animal. The, uh, the sacrifice, atoning. And again, it was a sin offering because the reason you had the disease was because of a sin. So therefore, the offering had to do with a sin of some sort. Now, Tsaris is the idea of you become proud, I guess is the easiest way to say it. In fact, the, the, the whole idea is, is the fact that you want to become Habitual. Do you want to become um, selfless in their in your dealings or your actions, whatever is going on? Now, in this selflessness that you've got going on, there there were three examples. I, I call them three good examples in the in the Torah that help us understand the three levels of of the, of the disease. The first one is the half Torah reading for this week, which comes from the Book of Kings. And it's a story of Naaman. Naaman was not a Jew. 
Now, Ammon was an Aramean. He was from the north country. He was north of Damascus. He was a great general. He was lauded because he's the general that fired the arrow that killed Ahab. So he became a strong member of the community. Everybody loved him. But he developed Cyrus on his skin. Nobody had a clue, again, just like with the Pharaoh. How do you take care of it? How do you get rid of it? Well, in their many wanderings, the Arameans had captured portions of Israel, and Jewish women had been sold into slavery. And so the little girl working as his wife's servant was a Jew, understood what was going on, and she says, you need to go to Israel, and you need to find our prophet, and our prophet will take care of it. He'll tell you how to get rid of it. So Naaman leaves Aram, and he goes south. First, he goes to Jeroboam, who, Cherethoam, who happens to be the king of the, of the northern tribes. He has no clue what to do with it. He's a non-believer. I mean, he is Jewish, but that's about all you can say for him. And so he's stressed out. He begins to tear his clothes open, thinking, what am I going to do? I, I don't want to go to war with the Arameans again. And so he's struggling. Well, at the same time, Elijah understands what's going on and sends a messenger to him. And the messenger says, send him to me. So Naaman comes down to uh, where Elisha is. Elisha doesn't even come to the door. Naaman walks, knocks at the door saying, I want to talk to your, your prophet. The prophet says, just go down to the Jordan, dunk yourselves, immerse yourself seven times, and you'll be healed. Well, the reason why he was there was because of his arrogance. The pride of having killed the king, the pride of having become the most celebrated man in his country had risen his level of arrogance. And so that is why he was given this, which also tells us that Gentiles could receive Tsaritz. And so with this disease, he says, the heck with this, I'm going home. There's got to be better looking rivers than the Jordan, especially back where I'm living in Damascus. Well, his servants convince him that he needs to just follow this guy's commands, this Elisha. Well, they notice the fact, had Elisha said something very difficult for you to do, you would have tried to do it the best you could. Why can't you just try to do this simple thing of immersing yourself in the water seven times? And so he did. And as he came out of the water the seventh time, we know that he was actually healed. And so he returns to uh, Elisha, only this time Elisha comes to the door to greet him. And Elisha and he have a conversation, a talk. During that time, we're not told, but I'm assuming because he's cured from this disease, he also has to go through the process of offering an offering, which stimulates him to thinking, I, I now believe in the one true God and not in all of the gods that I served. But he has a problem. The problem is the fact that his, when he returns, he's going to return to a place where he's not going to be accepted for the one true God. He still must hold in some form or fashion that the king and his gods are also important because he finds himself as the general in charge going with the king everywhere he goes. And so he would be involved in all of that. As the travel goes through, what happens? He says to, to Elisha, may I take the dirt from Israel back to Damascus? May I take the holy ground, put it under my altar so that I my altar becomes like Israel's altars? And so Elisha says yes, and so they packed up dirt and took it with them back to, to Aram. That was the first level. The idea in the first level, remember, is the fact that he had this blotch, this skin irritation. That's all he knew it was. Now, the second level that you go through, or the second more severe look, is, is the look of haughtiness, where you think you're superior to everybody except that those you know that are 
intellectually more superior than you are or a king. This is the haughtiness that gives you that 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 scab on your skin more than a, the blotch. But again, it's white, it's eggshell color, and the fact that it's in the, you're involved in this whole process. So in this particular case, this haughtiness would be like what David experienced. Remember, David spent six months with leprosy. Remember that when we talked our way through the, through, through the books of Samuel? He had leprosy because of the sins with Bathsheba. In other words, he committed no laws as far as Israel was concerned. But his laws that he violated were spiritual laws, and therefore he was punished with this disease. And so he began to loathe himself. Remember, he pushed himself down, all of the other things. In the process, while in his seclusion for the six months, remember, he spent his six months in the cemetery because he was as dead. At the end of the six months, the blotches disappeared. He had rectified in his own mind what he had gone wrong, and he now was returned to where he again went through the mikvah, went through the, the, the offerings that were necessary to move back into the palace again, where he ruled for another 14 years. The third possibility was the possibility of Miriam. Miriam had the worst example of this, because remember, as she was doing her thing actually Uzziah was another one that's those two characters are the ones that come to mind Miriam was affected by the disease when she spoke against her brother remember she looked at her brother and then she looked at her brother's wife and noticed that Moses was spending very little time paying attention to her and so Miriam took it upon herself to tell Moses how he should be living his life it was immediate at that point in time that she was stuck with, struck with leprosy. There was no hesitation. There was no way. It was the arrogant speech that she had at that moment. In other words, she put herself way beyond where she should. And she was now surrounding herself with all the emotions of why she was able to talk to him that way. At the end of that whole process, remember, she had Saras. Aaron and tells Moses, he's, and Moses never even thought about it. Moses evidently looked right through the disease and didn't see it. Aaron wakes him up, revives his mind and says, you need to get forgiveness for your sister. You need to pray for your sister's forgiveness. In the process of praying, Miriam was still isolated for seven days. Reason because she had the Saras, had to be taken out. At the end of seven days, she was brought back and the skin disease was gone. She had rectified the sin with between her and God. That's where it works at the end of that. Remember Uzziah. Uzziah decided, remember, in the days of, of Isaiah, went into the, into the temple and he decided that he was going to offer incense on the altar of incense as if he were a priest. He decided that because he was the king, and so he had all the power. So that's what he was going to do. But we know that at the end of that, Uzziah ended up getting Saritz. Uzziah never rectified that. Uzziah remained dead for the rest of his life. He spent the rest of his life in the cemetery. He never was healed. So it's a process of rectifying yourself calling upon yourself what did i do wrong how does i how do i manage to take care of this whole idea so again the disease we normally would recognize it on the hand but sometimes it was on the wall first then on your clothing then on the hand we don't really have examples of that because Obviously, again, it was a very personal disease, I guess, but it, the fact is that there was nothing there that would, would tell us anywhere about it. Now, at the end of all this, God speaks about haughtiness. 
In fact, in the book of Psalms, chapter 93, verse 1, it talks about the fact that this is that uh, God reigns and he is robed in haughtiness. Now, the haughtiness that he's speaking of is just a mere article of clothing that he puts on when he's in this world ruling in order for to instill fear in us. But that's not who God is. God takes off that robe and therefore becomes what we would call humble, just as Moses was humble. But working in this world, one has to put on something that they may not be, but they have to walk a very careful line when they do it. Now, it says that in the end, that the Messiah will come and the Messiah will have Saras. Well, if the disease doesn't exist, then what are we talking about? It's a spiritual understanding. In uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 22, it says, when the Messiah comes, well, why don't you turn back there? I've, I left myself some time. Turn back to Isaiah, chapter 59. And I want you to look at verse 22. Now they took it from my Bible. Maybe that's not where I found it. What it says is uh, when the Messiah comes, he can come one of two ways. He can come immediately on time or he can come early. Shoot. Apologize, I can't find it. I place the rather driver. Oh well, I have to forgive myself. Uh, I have a spot on my hand right now. But anyway, back to the story as we're going through this. The understanding is is that the Messiah will come when the world is ready. It's more and more looking like it won't be because everyone has repented and become humbled. But there will come a time, according to the, the, the writings in Sanhedrin, when the nations themselves will become so troubled that they'll ask for help out because all the kings will be Saras. All the kings will have no control. You know, for the longest time, I thought the United States was immune to all of this. But as I look at the world today, I'm not thinking that that's so. And so when the world gets to the point where all the kings are this way, we will find ourselves at the end of this process and God will send the Messiah who at this point in time resides in a city of Rome. Actually, the city of Rome is just a idea of not in Israel. Some places in the Bible in Isaiah also talks about him coming from Basra. But the idea is he comes from a, a metropolis outside of the land itself, but he will end up making himself known inside the land. Now, according to the stories, he will reveal himself or he will walk through the city of Jerusalem and will leave. Then he will return and he will leave again. But the third time he returns, the world is ready for him and he will take control. I just pray that he's already walked through twice so that we can get onto this other world, onto what's coming next. Okay, I've covered it. I don't know about the best way, but I've covered most of what I've learned this week. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask or begin to think about out loud for me? <laughs> 